It's always a good idea for crime shows to make it seem like progress is being made in the case, while at the same time introducing new elements and information to confuse the viewers even further. And that is exactly what Vigil does in its second episode. Hi there mate, how's it going? It's Benja here and this is a breakdown and review of Vigil episode 2. The emergency reactor shut down on Vigil is causing havoc as Gary Walsh gets caught in a nitrogen burst. Well, to be more exact, that happened at the end of episode 1 and now he is saved by Adams who takes Walsh to the sickbay. Doherty treats Walsh and it looks like he'll be fine. Vigil is running on batteries, they've got around about 3 hours of power in them, and afterwards if the nuclear reactor still isn't working, they'll have to use the diesel generators. I believe almost all nuclear subs use them as a backup power system, so that's no surprise. They also say that if they switch to diesels, they'll have to go to the surface and stick up a periscope, and from what I know that is accurate as well. Subs do need to surface to run the diesel engines, in fact that is one of the main reasons nuclear energy is preferred for submarines. Those types of subs can stay submerged for much, much longer than subs using diesel. Captain Newsom doesn't want Vigil to have to surface because remember they think they are being shadowed by another sub. So Hadlow, the chief engineering officer, has less than three hours to solve the problem and get the nuclear reactor working again. And while all this chaos unfolds, Silva is adamant about carrying on with her investigation. Her efforts are aided by Kirsten's work back home as she is able to get out of the naval base with Burke's USB stick. She can't access most of the files for now but Porter finds out who Burke had a fight with at a pub. Burke apparently fought two other sailors and one of them is Walsh, whose brother interestingly has a criminal record for possession of heroin. So Silva thinks that might be how the heroin got onto the sub. She searches Walsh's bunk and finds traces of heroin. She then confronts him and wants him to submit a drugs test. However, Walsh has three alibis for when Burke got attacked on the missile deck because Walsh was on watch. Plus the drug test reveals that he wasn't using them himself. So Walsh wasn't the one who attacked Burke and caused him to bleed. Interestingly though, Doherty's demeanor during this interview caught my eye. She seemed unusually nervous and a tiny bit twitchy, but we'll talk more about her later on in the video. Back at the naval base, Shaw finally gets to go ahead to share Silva's report with Kirsten and her superior Colin Robertson. So the police now know that Burke's death was suspicious because that is what Silva's report said. Kirsten also has a separate chat with Branning which reveals the reason behind Burke and Walsh's feud. You see, Walsh's younger brother, Douglas, was a trainee and he was dishonorably discharged after some bullying. Burke gave evidence against Douglas, which eventually caused Douglas to become an addict. Douglas killed himself soon afterwards and Burke showed up at his wake to apologize to Walsh. That is when Walsh and Hadlow beat the crap out of Burke. That's the pub incident we've been hearing about. Kirsten lets Silva know about this and she immediately conducts an interview with Hadlow. He doesn't say anything at first, but after learning about Silva's knowledge on the situation, he says it wasn't Walsh or himself that killed Burke. In fact, he says nobody meant to kill him. This implies that Hadlow knows who accidentally killed Burke, but he uses the chain of command defense just when Prentice shows up. Silva wasn't supposed to go around the sub without Glover, so Prentice locks her up in her quarters. She does something quite smart just before that though. She intentionally winds Prentice up about Burke, and he says Burke got exactly what was coming to him. Silva was recording this conversation, so she'll use it further down the line. For now though, being locked up triggers a flashback. We already knew she was involved in a tragic car accident, and now we know the details. I said in my previous video that this man is her husband, but that's not the case, they're not married, but they are a couple and they're thinking about getting married. However, that conversation is interrupted as they have to go off the road to avoid a van and they end up in water. Silva has to make a choice here, she either saves the girl or her partner, and she chooses the girl and they get to the shore. Silva goes back for her partner, but she's too late. 
I'm not sure if Silva is this girl's biological mother because she's not around anymore even though she survived. It's possible that she was taken away after the accident and she could be living with her biological mother. But that is just speculation at this point. This memory and being stuck in her quarters is no fun, so Silva finds a way to get out. Glover sees her and they have an emotional moment together as Glover helps Silva bounce back. Silva gets up and tries to arrest Prentice for obstructing a police investigation, holding an officer against her will and on the suspicion of Burke's murder. But Newsom takes both of them to somewhere more private to sort this out. Prentice denies everything and Hadlow doesn't rat him out either, so Silva is stuck, but this is where Glover comes in with a piece of incriminating evidence. He finds Burke's green fleece, which has been mentioned a couple of times. Burke was wearing it when he was on the missile deck, and it has blood on it, which doesn't belong to Burke. So it's probably gonna reveal who attacked Burke. Prentice knows denial is no longer useful because the blood is his, and Walsh has said that Prentice took the drugs off him. Prentice goes on to tell his side of the story. He says Walsh came to him trying to frame Burke for the drugs. Prentice didn't want to lose a good sailor like Walsh, so he swept this offense under the rug. Then, a few days later, Burke wanted to talk to Prentice on the missile deck, but he just started attacking Prentice and Prentice hit back. Prentice didn't intend to kill Burke, it was just caused by a punch thrown in self-defense. Prentice went to Burke's quarters to smooth things out, but Burke died within seconds. This is when Prentice planted the drugs to protect himself. That's all well and good, but this is where an incredible twist comes into play. While Prentice is telling his story, Silva keeps looking at the fleece on the table and she notices a weird substance on it. She connects this to Adams, who hasn't been feeling too well. He's been showing weird symptoms like aching and fever, just like Burke was hours before he died. Silva believes that a poisonous substance might have caused Burke's death and Adams gave Burke mouth to mouth while he was trying to save him, which is why Adams is now showing similar symptoms. I absolutely love this twist, which came into play just when it seemed like the culprit was caught. And here's my theory on why Burke was poisoned and who might have been behind it. I believe Burke was killed because somebody wanted to replace him with an undercover operative and that operative is Matthew Doward, who is now on sonar duty in place of Burke. Doward boarded the sub at the same time as Silva and I have a few reasons to be suspicious of him. First of all, he dismissed Keirley's assessment in episode 1 that the two different fishing trawlers being pulled down must be connected. Dower disagreed with Keirley because in my opinion he is working for whoever brought down those trawlers. So he doesn't want these two incidents to be connected. He doesn't want the trail to lead to his handlers, whoever they may be. The second reason I don't trust Doward is his supposed blunder in the middle of this episode when he couldn't spot a massive tanker on sonar. That sequence was absolutely hilarious by the way because the captain was using the periscope. How do you not see a tanker in that situation but whatever that's not the point. The point is Doward might have failed on sonar on purpose to sabotage the sub. I do not trust him one bit. That said, he isn't the one who killed Burke, of course, he wasn't on board. So who is this other operative? Right now, there are three people I suspect and one of them is Duckerty. This one is easy to explain, she is the medical officer so she probably knows how to poison someone and she seems more nervous than she should be around Silva. The second person I have my eyes on is the female cook we saw in episode 1. They made sure that the camera was focused on her at certain points when Burke's body was being carried and she would be able to poison him because she obviously serves him food. That's why I think she's an interesting left field pick. The most obvious but at the same time the most satisfying pick is Glover. I said in my episode 1 review that you should keep an eye on him and since then he's been able to form an emotional connection with Silva as he's gone out of his way to help her solve the case. He was the one who found Burke's fleece and I think Silva trusts him now, which is why his betrayal would be shocking to see and fascinating to watch. Meanwhile, Burke's girlfriend, Jade, tries to meet up with someone who claims they know what happened to Burke. 
I have no idea why Jade would agree to that after being so paranoid, but yeah, she ends up dead. At least she's able to send Kirsten the password to the encrypted files on Burke's USB stick, so there's that. Jade's killers are presumably the same people that burglarized Kirsten's house. Although, is it Kirsten's house or is it Silva's? I have no idea, to be honest. Somebody's house got burglarized and they were after the USB stick, which they did not find. So we'll learn a lot more about Burke in the next episode as the police review all of his files. By the way, the nuclear reactor starts working again at the end of the episode, so it's all good on that front. So I thought this episode was a little bit better than the first. The tanker sequence and Jade's decision to meet up with a complete stranger were horrible pieces of writing. But other than that, I like the general direction they're taking with this murder mystery. I was surprised to find out about the poisoning angle and it has made the story much more interesting for me. Before we wrap up, I just wanted to mention a couple of characters I don't particularly trust. One of them is this fella at the Dunlock Peace Camp, Ben Oakley. And the other one is Robertson, who is Silva and Kirsten's superior. Look at the lad with this adorable cat, he gives off major villain vibes to me. Well, what did you think about this episode? Leave your comments down below, like this video if you've enjoyed this breakdown, and subscribe for more movie reviews and TV show breakdowns. That's it for now, take care and see you in the next video.